Hello, and welcome to a special episode of the Batteries Included podcast. I'm Dominic Kioni, and my co-host today is Tom Malagny, Senior Editor at Inside EVs and host of the YouTube channel State of Charge. On today's show, we are pleased to be joined by Moshe Cohen, the founder and CEO of Gravity. You made national news a few weeks ago when you opened the Gravity Charging Center, which I believe has 24 charging stalls in a parking garage on West 42nd between 9th and 10th Avenue in New York City. And the headline touted that these are 500 kilowatt units, which are the highest power we have operating in the country, save for like a, there's a one 750 kilowatt a new charger out there in Mesa, Mesa Arizona. But uh, before we jump into that, I was hoping that you could tell us just a bit more about the company and uh, what, what the idea was when you founded it. Uh, I see your web, website has press releases on it uh, talking about an electric taxi fleet in, in 2021. So have you pivoted from that and are now focused on charging or are taxis still a part of the picture as well? I think the genesis is pretty important because the things we're doing are quite different. And I think a good, a good reason for that is the starting conditions were different. So we started in New York City. That's where we're headquartered. That's where I live. That's where a lot of us live. Um, originally, this was like pandemic time. Uh, Tesla went from sort of near bankruptcy to like the hottest company, releasing the Model Y, which we were excited about because it felt like it was the first time there was a car that could be a taxi in terms of high vehicle miles traveled. Uh, again, I was much more ignorant then than I am now. But um, uh, you know, sort of, and, and Tesla was sort of interested in that as well, proving that this car, this Tesla Y is essentially the next best selling car period. It could sort of be on the road a lot, take a heavy toll, um, you know, should be a lower cost of ownership. So that's what kind of got us excited. And then initially I saw the charging friction as potentially a, an impetus to move some efficiencies more towards a fleet. So I looked at yellow taxis, one of the most visible fleets in the world. There were a bunch of garage operators that were sort of making money. Uh, this isn't a medallion thing, just running the taxis. There's a lot of liquidity because you could street hail them. You can order them on an app. So I thought it'd be interesting to kind of put some yellow taxis, uh, EV yellow taxis. That was the genesis. And what happened was while I was in the process of doing it, I approached the charging industry as a consumer and I thought, all right, well, if I'm going to deploy a few hundred taxis in dense areas, you know, starting with Manhattan and surrounding areas, where would this equipment go and how do I really make it a lower cost of ownership than let's say a hybrid, which was the alternative. And what I found was that the equipment that was out there, um, I mean, the AC equipment, you know, we will have a conversation about that, but that doesn't even get you started. Like in terms of downtime, a lot of these vehicles are on the road in multiple shifts. Um, but the DC equipment was, was terrible. It was so terrible. It didn't even get, it wouldn't even fit under the ceiling of a normal garage, let alone, all these promises of smart and fast were, were, were completely false. And it would have been impossible to sort of run a fleet productively. Um, and, and I realized this was actually a generic problem where sort of the Southern California innovation of Tesla that went from, hey, EVs are not a golf cart, they could be kind of mainstream. That was more for like the luxury of space, which exists kind of in California. But when you think about how does that scale beyond, you need a different product and you need to actually be thinking more generally about electricity and energy and that became the foundation for what we're doing right now. What we what we started doing, say after the first year, where we kind of fully got into the full stack of. Then we called it charging. Now we call them deeps, distributed energy, distributed energy access. Um, uh, their access points, but really, from to, to summarize this, from looking at it as a customer and realizing this was no way this was was, was going to scale. We looked at all the com uh, companies that are out there. The only one that was somewhat reasonable was Tesla in the sense of the experience was okay for like early adopters, um, had to be full stack, had to be a full product that could go everywhere, had to be built for scale. That's the foundation of gravity that we'll talk about today. Okay. So the, the gravity website talks about a transformation of power. Basically it seems like delivering unlimited low pass, low cost power is a mission of the company. So is, is the goal also to like to create a national comprehensive DC charging network, or I, I saw a mention of servicing fleets. So I was just wondering what is the main focus of what you plan or how you plan to, or if you plan to serve the general public as well, or how that all works. What, like what's the Absolutely. So I like the title of your, of, your, of your podcast, and that's kind of our focus, right? So at first level, we don't look at uh, EVs as cars. We look at them more like a computer where the primary component is the battery. And fundamentally, these are 
the primary grid connectable batteries that exist. I think something like 90% of all grid connectable batteries between now and 2030 will be inside EVs. So our mission was, hey, we need to build this new grid. It's going to be powered by a lot of intermittents. There's going to be huge temporal variance in pricing. We want to connect these EV batteries to the grid or to power, hence the term access point, in all places they're parked. So rather than an ICE vehicle, it could be parked. That's kind of a waste, but not much to do about it. If you see an EV park, that's a wasted resource because that battery right now is not connected and not doing anything. And as an asset owner, you're wasting this huge power for batteries, which is like one of the biggest things we're after right now by just having it sort of like dead, not connected. We're making it live. So our goal is to connect all these batteries to grid in all places they are parked. Absolutely. Like uh, that would be the ideal, right? That sort of forget about DC charger, all these terms. Essentially, it's an access point and an outlet that's coupled immediately in all places cars are parked. Uh, we can go a little more deeply in terms of like the specific strategy. I mean, our huge, the huge comparative advantage that we have is, is urban versus suburban, which is let's say Tesla or Rivian. Um, okay. Urban is a different environment and that's kind of our initial focus. And I can talk about that uh, if you guys are interested. Yeah, um, I think so. So do you have ambitions to have like a network in different urban centers then across the country or is, are you sticking, are you kind of centered? Yes. In, just in New York City area? No, no, no. So we're, we're, we're active all over the, the, the country. Uh, it was a big milestone to sort of, you know, when you mentioned other chargers, I, I, I think a good thing to do is go on UL's website, which is the chief certifying agency and check, is this thing listed? Because right. the amount of things that people talk about versus the amount of things that are like actually listed by UL is it's a joke, right? So um, we took the approach of like, this is for scale, this is for the long term, has to go through safety and security of UL, where the standards are written. We released a host of products for every condition. We'll talk about hopefully some of them today. And we deployed it in the hardest place, which is New York City, with all the regulations that are out there. There's no, it's no coincidence that there's literally zero superchargers in New York City. You have to go all the way out to uh, JFK. And it's not because Tesla is unaware of New York. It's just a very different product in a very different condition. We are active across the country um, in different ways. Either we'd come in kind of like Tesla, take over the electricity and run, run the equipment at the site, or for a lot of folks, and I think this is very important, behind the fence, we offer a fully integrated software and hardware product and portal for, for people to deploy their own product. But absolutely, everywhere vehicles are stopped is where we, we, we feel like we should be and we have a lot to offer. Okay. So Mosh, let me ask you a quick question. A lot of the news stories said Google deploys stations in uh, New York City. Okay, yeah. um, really quickly, just explain your relationship with Google so people understand that. Google Ventures is 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 uh, Google's like the single LP for Google Ventures. Google Ventures is our lead investor. So this is Google Ventures as a VC that invested in us. This is we're not a subsidiary of Google, and we have other investors, but. Can't always control the headlines, you know. Yeah. I'd like to think Google's behind us. Uh, they are with their money, uh, and hopefully, um, we'll be able to announce sort of like widespread widespread partnerships in their assets. But we, but that has not been announced yet. Okay, cool. Um, so one of the things I found amazing was that um, uh, the site, this site, you had said that there were no, no additional infrastructure needed in the building. You're able to install this you know, huge system without doing any service upgrades. Now, I live 50 miles west of New York City. I'm relatively known in the EV charging space. And so I get people from New York City constantly contacting me, property owners, building owners, developers, saying, we want to install charging in our building. You got to help us. We don't know how to do it. Now, that's not my wheelhouse, dealing with utilities, getting service upgrades. You know, I've pointed people in the direction of DC fast charge manufacturers or whatever. But to hear you put out this, you put the system in with such enormous potential and power without having to do any uh, infrastructure upgrades, please explain. Yeah, absolutely. This is an extremely critical point. Like these issues that started with like charging and EVs are going to bubble up to like the future of energy, which all the implications all the way up to geopolitically. I think there's some things that are that are sort of there's some misunderstandings in the industry. First of all, when people say range anxiety, just as a preview, that's a preview for power anxiety. There's going to be power anxiety because there's more power that's needed. And if you're worrying about a blackout and not being able to power kind of all your stuff, that's going to create some serious anxiety. Now, there's a right way to do this and a wrong way to do this. So there is a ton of available power. We waste a tremendous amount of power. I think it's something like 
30% of the power generated actually just arrives somewhere. The inefficiency in the way power is generated, transmitted, and then distributed is huge. And what that leads to is that if you look at New York, right, buildings like New York, look at an avenue, there's a bunch of buildings connected to each other. All the power is completely disconnected. And the power in an individual building is budgeted based on what was the peak of the building over a two-year period looking at intervals. So there's just tremendous waste where you have very rare events of sort of consumption of power or historical uh, service limitations that are very high, where what EV charging and what EVs can do is really be a complement to other use cases in the, in the building. So essentially, you put in this EV, which is like I said, think of it as a battery on wheels. That battery can take power. So think of during the day when we're overproducing negative cost of renewable electricity, what do we do with it? Well, there's a bunch of batteries connected there through the access points that we've deployed that can take it. And then batteries could actually also smooth the power and send the power back to the building. That's that's something we're actively working on the certification of. So everything we put in is bi-directional ready or two-way power ready. So fundamentally, you're going to have integrated batteries within buildings that smooth this. But to answer your question at a very basic level, there is a ton of available power in New York City right now. It's just you have to be able to, to co-locate within the building, not some crazy bunch of towers half a mile away that they're calling fast DC charging. That's 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 There's no way it could fit in the building. So you want to co-locate. Similarly to what you do with those chargers behind you, you're co-locating with other uses of power. And then you're utilizing the uh, the power that's not being used or efficiencies that are created in the power. And that's a ton of power. That's not a small amount of power. I mean, you're able to sort of onboard appliances in your house and charging and all that stuff. So think about that when you're talking about a building that or like multiple buildings that are scaled up. In the site in, in, in um, Manhattan Plaza, we brought extra power from one building and another building, both to the garage. There's still a ton more we could do, but we brought close to three megawatts. We're not touching anything that's there. And that's, a, that's not a, a, a very rare situation. That's a pretty common situation. And so we just need to be, we're moving from an era of kind of, let's just pull resources out of the ground. Oh no, we're running out of power to, hey, we need to be smarter about how we utilize the resources that we already have and the new ones in terms of renewables. And when we do, we can go from scarcity to abundance, which is kind of like what American innovation always does. We take a situation of scarcity, create abundance by utilizing technology. Same thing is happening here if you do it the right way. Cool. Okay, so there's definitely some load distribution going on. And as far as like uh, if 20 cars pull in and they're all, you know, pulling 100 kilowatts or whatever, and then it's the middle of the summer and every apartment has their air conditioning bla bl blasting and, you know, there's another event that causes people to, to, to use a lot of electricity, the power will um, get, uh, say, reduced to the charging stations or will, or will you? Will, will, yeah, but I mean, that's a deliver? generic. Yeah, so there's there's a few things to understand in terms of how you balance all this at scale, right? Like right now, charging is like emergency. There's nowhere to charge. The chargers are super slow. People are going to the same place at the same time. All the, the grid consumption is very bunched. Now, imagine a world where you, you never go to a charging station because you just park where you would park anyways. You know, we don't need any extra space, by the way. Um, I want to talk about uh, this product we released today, which is very relevant, which will like immediately flip this. Um, right. And then... Your car is just connected as much as possible. And over time, this averages out, right? Because you're not going to exact, not every, it's going to be impossible for everyone to exactly need power at exactly the same time if they're always connected. It smooths out. And that's how a utility manages power, right? A utility is essentially trying to smooth power out across all the different use cases. We're not building generation imagining that every single power drain that could be on the grid is fired up at the same time we're balancing things out more. And so if you do this the right way, you will never feel uh, a throttle down at all. You'll just, you'll literally never feel it. It's invisible. It's just balancing power the way we're doing it with other places. It's just not happening right now. Um, yeah, and I wanna, uh, if I may, just talk about like one other piece that's just huge for cities. So we launched today, uh, you know, we call this deeps and we're calling the speed deep speed because uh, what you need to think about with cars is the most important metric, which I hope, you know, folks like you guys will cover, is not like, can you go zero to 60 in like one second faster? Like you're not even allowed to drive 60 in New York. It's 25 mile per hour speed limit. What's really important is like your upload and download speed, just like the internet, right? With cars, like how fast can you upload and download power? It's because you want to have zero downtime. So we talk about deeps and deep speed and deep speed is essentially 
filling up a gas tank 200 miles in five minutes. There's the indoor garages, there's the buildings, there's the challenges there. Another huge one is curbside. So our proposal is to take 10% of all metered parking and put in a curbside deep, which is already exists. It's in Manhattan Plaza. You could see it. It's UL listed. The curbside deep is a similar size to the chargers you have behind you. You can mount it on a pole 10 feet up, and that will be um, at least 13 miles in uh, th um, 200 miles in 13 minutes, 200 kilowatts, boostable to 500 kilowatts. We could deploy literally thousands of those on curbsides immediately. And so the product is available, the hardware is available, and the ability to have batteries connected as much as possible is available. Once they're connected as much as possible, you have a lot of flexibility to balance that power. Then everybody gets all the power they want. We're able to bring in all this renewable power and use it and not waste a lot of it. A lot of it's getting wasted because there's nowhere to take it. So this is kind of like where all these things kind of come together. It's in the it's in the batteries. So <laughs> it's perfect for this uh, podcast. So does that make sense? To, yeah. yeah. So I just want to back up just a little bit and just talk about the uh, the equipment for a second. So sure. So right now you have the 500 kilowatt uh, units deployed. Uh, see, most most EV drivers are used to roll up to a DC charger somewhere, and they're like often like super big. Uh, gravity units right. appear to be much smaller. Like I think it, on the on the site they say like they're eight inches thick and eighteen inches yeah. high, and, and probably a bit yeah. uh, wider than that. Um, so does gravity manufacture these? And yes. and how are they so much smaller than what we see at typical charge stations? Well, we just think about it at scale. So yes, we've designed it, we manufacture it. Um, it was critical because again, your your primary goal is have EV batteries connected to power in all places they're parked, or bring charging to cars, not cars to chargers. All the same thing, right? The size of the access point has to be small enough to fit in any footprint of a park of parking space. So what, if it's if there's a ceiling limitation, it has to get mounted on the ceiling in the negative space above the, the windshield, and you need to be able to pull under it. If it's curbside, it has to be on a pole, invisible, just like other signs in the street. You won't even notice it, right? So that was a critical condition because if the size is not there, it won't. You can't be co-located, and that's why in California. You go to a mall, we have EV charging. Yeah, it's half a mile from the entrance. It's a, it's terrible. You know, it's really far away because it's so big, right? right. So um, um, how do you do it? The way you do it is you think about it at scale. So we're, we've designed equipment assuming all parking spaces have access points or at least a good fraction of them. So what we do is we have a centralized power center, which are these interconnected power cabinets. They could be, you know, megawatts of power. They go where the rest of the power is, right? Either in their own area or in the switchgear room. Most of the components kind of live there. There's very flexible, a very flexible switch matrix. So part of the uh, answer to what we said before was we're able to take any kilowatt of power that comes in from the it, as a feed. It could either go to the building, to the building's use case, or to the charging area. And amongst the charging area, it could get allocated to any one of the access points. And that could happen in real time. So, so think about it as like, like, like water. A drop of water comes in. We decide where does it go. And as cars need more or less or their priorities change, we can be flexible about it. All of that stuff happens in this power center, in the, in the power cabinets. They're off-site. All we have on the, in the access points is the smallest amount of components to allow you to connect. The difference is between the difference is do you have liquid-cooled or air-cooled? And when we do liquid-cooled, which is what you need for continuous, another thing to notice is when people mention their kilowatts, is it continuous? When we see 2,400 miles per hour, that means... Literally, we've run these things for weeks straight, not hours straight. So this is a continuous speed. So in order to run uh, above 200 amps continuous, you need to have uh, liquid cooling uh, within the within the cables. And we have a variety of ways to do that, liquid to air, liquid to liquid or liquid, or air-cooled. And so it's re-architecting a system in order to be very flexible and have the part that interfaces with the customer be as small as possible so that there's literally no footprint of a parking space where it cannot be in installed without any dedicated space. That was the these, starting condition <laughs> of all of this. These liquid cooled cables, are they new that you've developed or did you resource them from existing uh, vendors? Yeah, I mean, um, we have not developed our own cable yet. Uh, it's a main, it, for, for me, it's one of my, my, my big sort of pain points right now that, I'm, that we're working through because it, it's just like, again, new technology has to be cheaper, faster, better than what's out there. Connecting a CCS1, I mean, NACs will be a little easier. These CCS1 cables, I mean, we, we build custom retractors. We have counterweights. We have all this stuff. They're still not where they need to be in terms of cables. Um, 
we haven't I decided mean, yet if we're going to make our own cable. Right now, we're we're literally sourcing all the available cables that are out there. We're working with adapters and stuff like that. But um, that's going to be a big question. I think the cables have to get a lot friendlier because right now they're they're still we still haven't cracked it to the point where I'm that I'm happy with. I mean, it's not like there's no cables on the floor. We have these ceiling retractors above. They don't take up any space. They're counter There's counterweights. But I want this thing to be as smooth as plugging in a cell phone, and it's not quite there yet. And so it's something we're very actively working on internally in our mechanical engineering department. So with your cord management system that you have now for the parking garages, it's like you said, it's an overhead system. It's kind of like a big oval with the uh, with the cord wrapped around in, in some way. So can it reach every corner of the car, basically, or whatever? So whatever car you have, you know, everybody, every car seems to have a different location for a charging port nowadays. So, so yeah, that's unfortunate. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, we've kind of chosen, addresses that. Yeah. So we're always we're always thinking about the constraint, right? So if you take an underground parking garage the, in, in Manhattan, you have a very low ceiling. That's your mm -hmm. main constraint. So you need right. a very small unit ceiling mounted. The car has to be able to pull under it so that there's no wasted space. And then where does the cable slack live? The cable slack can't live in front of the car, so it naturally lives on top of the car in an oval above it. But that's just the, that's for that use case. For a curbside charger, there, there's no vertical limit, right? So the, the cable could sort of live on the post, and we design these custom smart posts that have a, a vertical angle and then in like an obtuse uh, horizontal angle, and the cable lives there. So the idea with the cable is just, get it out of the way and have enough, right. as you mentioned, length to reach any type of condition. I mean, whether it's a medium or heavy duty vehicle, um, either any side, if, of course, if you park curbside, you literally have zero flexibility in terms of where it moves. So we're using quite large, uh, long cables. I mean, right now they're like six or seven meters on the curbside, they may be 25 feet. Uh, so it makes our job even harder on the mechanical side, but absolutely you could fit any, any condition whatsoever. So you're never gonna be blocked like you know, like some of these new, some of these chargers, like what Tesla's done with superchargers to sort of deal with this problem is use much shorter cables. So if you have a shorter cable, it's easier to manage. But then, you know, once you start opening this up to a whole bunch of other uh, OEMs, you're going to have length issues, right, in terms of where it is. So we've taken the different approach. You can, you can fit in anywhere. And now we have to solve for making it really, really easy to use, sort of like the way Tesla superchargers are when they plug. Right. So I know we don't have a lot of time. Could you talk about pricing, your pricing model? Is there a, su a subscription fee? Is it per kilowatt hour? Do you have idle fees if a car just stays there and, and forgets to unplug and, and blocks the space? Talk a little bit about your pricing. Uh, or, so, also, look, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, also, is there a payment point on, on the, on the yep. boxes as well? Okay, sorry. Yeah. So, look, I'm a, I'm a former economics professor <laughs> in my previous life. I have spent a lot of time thinking about pricing. And one thing I've learned since being a professor is you have to kind of introduce things, not the optimal thing right away, but meet people where they are, where the pain point is, and, and sort of go from there. So right now, to me, in an ideal world, pricing will be based on time and kilowatts, just like you do with taking an Uber or taking a Lyft, because fundamentally, when a car is in a space, it's taking up time, space, and electricity. Right now, it's sort of this like per kilowatt model. We've stuck to the per kilowatt model. Um, for now, they're just, just a basic per kilowatt hour charge. Um, no idle fees yet, but we'll, we'll, we will have limits on time. Um, and, uh, we're not forcing you to download an app, although you will be able to download an app. It's literally just like Tesla. You plug in, we have a uh, remote authorization. We recognize the Mac ID of the vehicle. So you only have to register once you plug in, you charge, uh, it could be, you could just be automatic payment based on your profile, or you just tap and leave. It's just a single tap and leave. Uh, that's just to make it, you know, meet people where they are. People don't want like 8,000 new apps, especially before we've convinced people this is worthy. Um, but uh, yeah, over time, you see what's going to happen. And this is why I love these podcasts and people looking at this. What's going to happen is there's a very, very important education process that needs to happen right now in the U.S. Because until gravity, the pain point was the chargers. And so the OEMs could say, oh, yeah, yeah the chargers are, are bad, but they're going to get better. We've come and said, no, guys, we've actually built technology and deployed it. There's no car in the world, as far as I know, there's no car in the US that can fully do deep speed. The batteries do exist, though. The batteries that do deep speed, the batteries that charge at 480, 500 kilowatt, they exist from the same manufacturers that are giving these OEMs the slower batteries. They're available and they exist. The OEMs have not sort of switched to them. 
But that has to be something that, that consumers are made aware of. That if you're a consumer and you're buying a vehicle, you should be able to check the specs and know what kind of battery are you getting? How fast is, the deep, is it relative to deep speed upload and download? Or if you're a fleet owner, you need to be able to see this. What we're seeing in our site is, you know, is a lot of people that are not aware of it. So for example, um, Kia has a Kia Nero that charges about a third of the speed as a Kia EV6. Mm -hmm. So some of these fleets out there have bought a bunch of Kia Neros and we're like, hey guys, if you spend like a couple thousand dollars more on an EV6, your charge time is like reduced to like a third. So be aware what you're buying, you know? And so I think this is gonna be really important. I think it's a consumer protection issue because if even if all of us go on, we kind of know what we're doing, try to buy a car and understand what battery we're getting. We don't get a lot of information, even though it's the highest cost component and it's not made by the OEM, it's coming off the shelf from Japan or China. So I think it's gonna be really, really important to create visibility there. And then so folks know, like, do they have zero downtime, higher downtime? And then to the point about pricing, for us, all of our equipment is deep speed. So like, we don't want somebody sitting there for two hours because they bought the wrong vehicle. That's costly to us. And that's gonna be something that eventually will cost uh, more money to incentivize people to sort of do the right thing in terms of their purchases. Right on. Uh, so uh, just talking about your 200 kilowatt curbside units, which you're kind of announcing right. today. Um, yeah. So I've always thought of, of curbside, thought of curbside chargers as sort of low power, long duration in neighborhood type situations where people, you know, maybe park street park close to their house or apartment and, you know, get a few kilowatt you know, feed of a few kilowatts, like charge overnight or whatever. But these are 20 times more powerful than that uh, and DC charging. Uh, so where do you envision, envision them being used and uh, what's the plan for the rollout exactly? Do you have any yeah, installations no, already you. in development and, and, and also one, so these all require the, uh, the distribution points are small, but they, re they require like a power cabinet somewhere. So how, where do you locate those for street charging? Yeah. Thank you for that question. Um, 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 I think it's important to clarify this. Let's take the highest vehicle mile traveled individual, which is like an, a taxi driver or an Uber driver. People are saying this, oh, the Uber driver is going to park, they're going to charge where they live in, in by their home in a curbside charger. What that requires is that literally there's a curbside charger for every parking space of every Uber driver. Because if you're going to rely on that, that means that if you can't find it and you're circling around and you can't find that space, you can't work tomorrow because you're relying on that for charging. That's a very expensive uh, mistake if you can't find it. New York spent like five years putting 100 curbside chargers. Like there's 3 million parking spaces. So just, just to give a sense, our view is no, like it's better to put the charging. Eventually I'd love every space to have an access point, as I said, but just knowing how things go, if you take Manhattan, for example, we have 80,000 metered parking spaces. Our proposal is let's put 10% of those, put a, put a, a, a deep, the deep in 10% of those, which means now the nice thing about metered parking is it's in highly trafficked areas. It's, it's managed. So, you know, you can't just stay there forever and it's, it's everywhere, right? So you could stop for 30 minutes, go to the bathroom, get a drink in areas where there's meter parking. So there's other things around charge up really quickly and go. Then you can do like 20 sessions, 30 sessions per deep. So that allows you to do a few thousand. And then you're, you're essentially enabling hundreds of thousands of sessions immediately. And this is something we could do like in the next one year, two years, there could be thousands of these at these points. I think that's the order that we should do in terms of electrification. We have the product ready to deploy. Uh, there's a sort of a bunch of RFPs or RFPs forming to do this, like kind of across major cities that we're pretty actively in. So I can't really, you know, t talk about exactly where they are, but uh, we would love to see putting out thousands of these immediately because that'll immediately uh, relieve this pressure. Now, where does the power come from? This goes back to this point of what you could do with EV batteries. So essentially, if we deploy on a parking on a on a street block, it's about we could deploy about 12 deeps and they take up about a third of the of the block. Right. So if you put a bank of like 12 of these, they look like kind of like the city bikes and there'll be all this beautiful architecture and stuff uh, on the curb. All you need is one point in one of the buildings in the whole area where we could kind of sneak in a pretty small cabinet doesn't have to be anywhere near anything, could be out of the way. And once again, we tap into this unused wasted power on the block. All of these blocks have plenty of wasted power, a lot more than what's needed to share across sort of even 12 of these deeps. And the beauty of this is that once you do that, 
Imagine you have, you know, potential blackout and the city needs new, new, more power or something. And say, okay, guys, we're going to put some fleet vehicles here. They're going to serve as demand response. They're going to go back into the that same grid area. Now we have demand response access points, like in all of these blocks that are a public service to like the city. And we're electrifying a lot faster. I think this is like a critical part of like massively accelerating it. Because if we put in a thousand of these, 2000 a year, whatever, uh, we'll be ahead of the adoption of New York. Right now, in the past like few months, there's like 10,000, I think, uh, for hire vehicles in New York that are electric because there was this change of rule with the Taxi and Limousine Commission. Think about putting in more than 10,000, probably 20, 30,000 level twos, how long that's going to take where they live versus let's put a, few, a couple hundred deeps on the curb where they're dwelling anyway. We'd solve that like immediately. That's something we could do right away. So I really hope that uh, people, folks will think about how like, like think about the the how much you pay for a mistake of not being able to charge when you're relying on it for your livelihood if that's the case the infrastructure has to be ahead and i think it should be in the dwell area of the vehicles rather than in the living area of the vehicles for folks who don't have uh, indoor garages right very interesting okay and as to uh, to your point a lot of uh, a lot of these vehicles taxis they go 24 hours anyway absolutely i grew up in the taxi business my dad my dad had taxi business and yeah it's it's 24 hours you have different drivers driving every vehicle it's just yeah you have to just maximize utility for that um, absolutely yeah so, we yeah, want so, zero so, downtime that's the that's the goal right so they're going to take so a right. bathroom break or a lunch break but um right. there should be charging there yeah right sorry. charging where, where the work is actually happening rather than in in suburban neighborhoods basically it's like yeah, where they work is the curb. <laughs> By the right. curb. Although I do, I do see, you know, for other people who aren't, you know, in the city a lot. I mean, I th and our, our apartment dwellers or whatever. There, I think we do need some infrastructure in suburban sure. areas like that. But, sure. but, but to put your point, these like dense inner city or cities like this, this is, yeah, putting the charges where where they're being driven is kind of makes sense, right? I mean, we're going to release a product next year that's for home. Essentially, okay. we want every battery to be connected at all times. It's just more like what needs to happen first in order to be ahead of the transition. That's how we're thinking about it. Right. Uh, so I, I feel there's like a lot more of the story to explore as, mm -hmm. as we go along in, in the future. But uh, I think that might be good for today. Tom, do you have any other questions? No, I think that's pretty good. You know, we're, we'll, we'll follow up. We'll for sure be back in touch and uh, Follow yeah. up on the progress of the company yeah. um, over the coming months. Please, please, please come by for a tour anytime because seeing is believing, and when you see it, 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 it hopefully will look even obvious, even though it's uh, quite ahead of what's uh, other options out there. Right. Yeah, I know. I know Tom is planning on uh, wants to go check it out, and I believe our other one of our other co-hosts uh, in the U.S., uh, Kyle, Kyle Connor, he's. He wants to go drop by soon. He he might just he's like he'll just drop by. He'll just show up. <laughs> hey, great. Anyway, great. Um, right. So thank you for spending this time with us, Moshe. And uh, what's the best way for people to keep up with the company? Uh, we're uh, they could go to the website gravitytechnologies.com. We have a LinkedIn page. Uh, our social channels are getting in the process of being built out more. We do have a Twitter page, but it's not very active. But uh, mm -hmm. it will be. But I would say just just look at the website, look at LinkedIn posts right now, and we'll build up uh, uh, Twitter as well. And hopefully um, we'll have a continuous coverage in the media since it's such a central topic to how things are developing. Uh, we have a whole bunch of announcements that are sort of planned over the course of the year. So, uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, I would say um, poke and prod and, and ask questions and kick the tires or, or, or look in the battery because this is a pretty major revolution that's happening right now and there's a mm -hmm. right way to do it and there's a wrong way to do it like look around the world i traveled all over the world i went to china to europe to all these other countries like how are they doing it like what's working what's not working we're we're not the first but we can leapfrog and be the best and i think that's what you know folks in this country expect and so trying to do our part here and thank you for uh you know the conversation and covering us and the interest in us yeah no problem uh all right, so I guess that brings us to the end of our show. If you have any questions or comments, uh, please leave them below or get in touch with us on the social media platform of your choice. Uh, don't forget, if you like the show, please give us a thumbs up. Uh, click subscribe, tap that bell icon for notifications, and thank you all again for joining us. We'll see you again very soon. Ciao. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Tom.